This is Dolphin Financial Radio, a show about planning your retirement. When you are young, financial decisions are easy. You aren't worried too much about the future, and you know you have plenty of time on your side. However, as you get older, the financial decisions get more difficult. Eventually, you reach, you reach the age where you face decisions about employment, home buying, raising a family, and college planning. Your financial success is often determined by how you handle the many curveballs thrown your way and by how much you are saving for retirement. Before you know it, you are within 10 years, five years, and then one year of retiring. At this point, you'll be facing new and different financial challenges. You'll worry if you have enough money to last through retirement. You'll be concerned about health care and longevity. You'll want to make sure your retirement is everything you always dreamed it would be. These are the retirement challenges that we will address each week on this show. Regardless of how far you are from retirement, it's time to listen in as we begin another episode of Dolphin Financial Radio. Good morning and welcome to another Dolphin Financial Radio show with me, Dan Wendell. Your host alongside me, as usual, is Tony Shore, my trusty sidekick. Tony, welcome to the show. We're going to have a good one today, as we usually do. Today's topic is going to be answering the question, retirees need more risk, yes or no? I mean, this is the topic we're going to be addressing. I already know the answer, but you may not know. Um, But I have a feeling that most of the listeners out there would think it's counterintuitive to suggest that retirees need more risk because I have a feeling everyone's hearing, oh, we need less risk as we get older and get closer to retirement. That's what I keep hearing. But I'm, I, I keep hearing you need more and more that's safe, protected. I hear these words like safe, protected, uh, guaranteed, less risk, lower the risk. Don't take risks in retirement. Uh, you need less risk. So I'm interested to hear your take on this because I think it's a pretty universal take that as we get older, we got to have less risk. Uh, you need to avoid risk at all costs. Uh, I hear this from other talking heads on TV and radio. So, wow, Dan, this should be interesting. I can't wait to hear what you have to say. But before you jump into that, Dan, I want to thank you for having me on the show again. I love doing the show. As you know, every week we have some fun with it. But how have you been? I know you've been doing a lot of traveling and I imagine you're keeping busy meeting with clients, et cetera. Well, I have been busy traveling. I did just get back from New York recently. I was up there visiting my parents who still live in New York. And by the way, Tony, did you hear my dad on the radio intro? Uh, to the listeners out there. If you, I did. That was a surprise. Right? You you changed up the intro and you've got your son and your father on there. And I think that concept is so cool. You came up with that idea yourself, didn't you? Oh, thanks for the credit, Tony. <laughs> I came up with the concept. You shot it down and said, no, the listeners wouldn't like it. And uh, I did I not did say anyway. that. I didn't say that. <laughs> you said that. it's too endearing. It sounds too real. <laughs> no. no, I love it. And uh, Mix Master Mitch, uh, Mitch Heil, our right. sound editor and producer, made it happen. I like it. Right. And I had you know my son in there, my dad in there, and it sounds great. And I'm sandwiched in the middle, just like real life. You know what I mean? That's true. That's <laughs> true. You're part of that sandwich generation right there. You got your kids on one side and your uh, aging parents on the other. I love and it. And everyone's got Dad a hand sounds out. sounds great. Right? Everyone's got their hand out, particularly my sons. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, at this point, it, y- your kids are young enough where, yeah, they're going to be costing you money for a long time yet to come, Dan. And just to, it's funny. Just to let you know. You, you've heard my story about... My kids and their health, breaking the elbows and and uh, costing me big bucks at the uh, for health insurance and health care costs. Um, yep. And and TVs and TVs, right? So I'm throwing telling, the Wii so remote through the television. I may be counterintuitive to most listeners out there, in where I'm suggesting to my children, you need to take less risk, and to my parents, you need to take more risk, right? Which is complete opposite of what everyone else tells you, at least when it comes to finances. And um, I I do want to address this topic to today um and as it relates to my clients but also my family but before i do i want to find out you know you find out i'm doing okay i have visited my family and it's everything's going well how are you what's what's up with you there's got to be something interesting tell me something i don't know about you tony <laughs> tell me something that wow surprise that's me. tough you know everything dan um 
uh, you know everything there is to know about me. I mean, you know, the golden pipes, That's right. my good looks, the charm. Do you like um, movies about gladiators? <laughs> How about that? <laughs> <laughs> I've never spent time in a Turkish prison. That's one thing you can learn about me. Um, no, I, uh, I've i just been, I'll tell you, the weather, you know, has been warm, <laughs> to mm-hmm. say the least, but... Uh, I've been trying to get things done around the house and spend more time with family. Uh, completely redid. My daughter is 15, mm. going on 16, and so uh, we hadn't done anything to her bedroom. So it's just collected all the stuff over the years and still had some elements of a little girl's bedroom. So it was time. So we got her. We took everything out. I made her go through everything and sort it into piles, I said, I said, if it's not something you've used recently, if it's nothing you're ever going to need again, put it in this, these bins. If it's something you want to store and it's really something we should hang on to, put it in a storage bin and keep, and the smallest pile should be what you're going to keep in your room. And I try, try not to leave anything in that pile. I see where this is going. (laughs) Yeah. We got rid of uh, as much stuff as possible, took everything out and then started from scratch. Uh, to make more room, put in even put in a little couch. Got her a new TV. Um, I can't believe, by the way, how cheap TVs have gotten. <laughs> You're sitting here complaining about a I know a uh, <laughs> Wii remote going through a TV. I mean, we got a 32 inch smart TV that is loaded with everything. It's like a Roku TV for a hundred and thirty eight dollars. And and you pay 138 just to have the cable connected to it. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. The cable's more than the TV at this it's point. It's like printers, sure. you know. You pay for the ink. <laughs> oh, the printers are ridiculous. Our printer just went out. In fact, that happened the week before. Our printer went out. We had a really nice one. It had lasted a while, and it was a Wi-Fi printer, so we could all use it in the house. And with three kids and my wife, you know, we have to have a working printer because they have school projects and things. And uh, I know the kids today say, wait, you still print things? How old are you? And I say, and I say, yeah, not only do I print, still print things, but I actually still make appointments and keep them. Oh, wow. <laughs> Deep. You know, it's funny. The, the society that we have is moving to a subscription model. It used to be yeah. the companies would sell widgets and make money, but you find more and more of them are trying to make money through a subscription model because people just – getting used to that now cell phones you know um you can't even buy the cell phone outright they want you to pay monthly <laughs> why yep. why because you don't you don't see it you see the tv commercials oh only 199 dollars a month for lease you know, why not just talk about the upfront cost because people don't do it now everything is subscription nope. everything and amazon you know they, that amazon prime they want you to pay for the year you know monthly fee or the annual fee to just uh get free shipping yeah. but um and it and what happens is people are you find out more and more that you're spending all this money you don't even know where it's going and then you have to start looking at your monthly statement saying wait what what do i really need netflix and amazon prime do i you know i got a roku tv whatever that means by the way um yeah <laughs> you, uh, apple tv uh, roku tv hulu uh, netflix it's like, now, now even CBS has a paid subscription service. It's like CBS, right? Wait a minute. I thought you know monthly payments for you know I, it's, we're going on a tangent here, but I I remember when uh, there used to be debit collectors door to door for life insurance premiums. Remember those? I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> I don't yeah, remember that, I, Dan. I, but the, you go. How old are you? <laughs> you'd actually go door to door to pick up the the money. To pay for the life insurance thing. This is before wow. before uh, people had the electronic funds transfer. But now, yeah. um, anyway, so <laughs> I'm glad you're doing well. I did read a book about minimal, minimalistic lifestyle, getting rid of stuff uh-huh. and how it makes yep. you happier. Um, yeah, it does. And getting rid of stuff is something my wife and I are going to do. Um, one of the things we determined was, and what I read that I found interesting in the book, is that don't try to sell things. Because it's, you're just going to be disappointed. the The suggestion was just give it away, give it away. Hmm. And Interesting. because you have a garage sale and someone you know haggles you for twenty cents on something you've paid forty bucks for, you're like, is it worth it? So you're better off donating it. Just the thought. Hmm. Anyway, I, I I have yet to prove it. I'm going to be toning down my uh, garage because I look like a pack rat with all my stuff in there. But 
Uh, we do too. We have so much stuff, and we're trying to we're trying to do that. We're trying to get rid of stuff, and it does feel good. Like I told my daughter, how much better now does it feel? Uh, you you collected all this stuff and you hang on to everything, but doesn't it feel better to have a nice, clean, open room and not have to worry about all that clutter and junk? Just watch out for leveling, and that's where you you clean out a space and then fill it with other stuff. And just move stuff within the house, you know, to another yes, part. Yes, exactly. That's the problem. <laughs> it's got to go to the trash or donate it. Yep, All right. exactly. It's got to go out. Okay, Sorry. so Sorry, the I topic go. today, <laughs> the topic we were supposed to talk about. Yes, topic we were supposed what? to talk about is. You have to remind, I've completely forgotten now. Yeah, once you start talking about, <laughs> you know, cleaning house, you get, you know, cleans out your, your the, the, to, uh, the you empty space between your ears. And, Right, so you're the going question to try to is, explain to me why we need more risk. I, 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 this should be interesting. Yeah, do retirees or people approaching retirement need more risk? No, they need the safety. End of story. No, actually, I'm going to say yes, they do, and it's it's counterintuitive, but I want to talk about it today because I think what's happened is we've gotten to this sensational society of you're going to run out of money. I, I mean, how many times can I hear the stats that people fear running out of money more than they fear dying? I mean, it seems ridiculous, that concept, but it's true. And why? Why do? I mean, you see these commercials. You see, like, people walking on these imaginary, like, bar graphs and, hey, how come you stopped over there? I ran out of money, you know? It's And they're joking about it. But I think what happens is people get into this situation where they're trying to determine how much they need, and um, they're getting a little frustrated because they say, I'm never going to have enough. And there's this, a lot of companies that are, particularly those that are offering some sort of solution, are suggesting, oh, you, you need to watch out and not run out. But um, most of the time, and the answer is, which is what you've already said, we need more safety, right? That as you get older, you need to put more and more away in safekeeping. And that's just been the conventional wisdom but there's a different way of approaching this, and that's what I want to talk about today because I believe that as you get older, you might actually have, as a percentage of your total va of net worth or whatever investments, you'll have more at risk as you get older, which I've mentioned before on other shows briefly, but I want to spend the whole show talking about that. What do you say? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm waited with bated breath trying to figure out where you're going to go with this. So you're going to have to explain to us uh, what you mean by as you get older or in retirement that we need more risk. Right. Totally counterintuitive. So let's let's talk about why people are even thinking about how much risk they should take, because some people don't even think about it, by the way. I mean, a lot of people don't. I was talking actually yesterday with a a couple of guys that are middle-aged and they were talking about how um, one of them actually self-employed and the other one works for the government. He's a, uh, he works in, in the police. So he's got a pension and you know, the drop program here in Florida and, and so forth. So he's, he's like, you know, I'm not really doing much for time. It's all, you know, I'm just getting it out of my paycheck and putting it away. And you know, once I get my 20 years in, cause he works in the high special forces, which is, you know, shorter timeline to get, the full pension um he's like you know I, I think i'm okay but listening to you and he's like because he was talking to me about the health care costs he's like i pay 150 every paycheck so that's 300 a month from my family of four you guys are and the other guy was paying 20, over 2,000 a month for his family of five and i'm paying 1400 a month for my family of five um he's like i can't believe this he's like maybe i'm getting a good deal here and i don't even realize it and so what's happened is he's basically his retirement plan is set for him. the pension, the investments. He's not really thinking about it. He's got his thrift savings plan, TSP for those government employees. You know exactly what I'm talking about. TSP thrift savings plan. But for the self-employed like myself, it's like we have to do this on our own. So um, what's happening is more and more people are being forced to do it themselves. And so the guidance has been as you get older, you need to have less at risk because what happens if we have a correction like in 08, the biggie, you know, we lost 30% in a year. What happens if you go to retire and you need that money? Now 30% of it's gone. It throws retirement out the window. So the, the general solution is, well, don't put it in the, in, in the market where it can lose 30%. That's not necessarily the case. 
and I'll tell you why. Um, what is the real reason people are afraid to run out of money? Because they don't want to be destitute and, and you know be a burden on others, right? Um, Medicaid is the state system, and you have to be pretty you know destitute to get on there. You know, two thousand dollars to your name, um, but that covers it's a safety net. People don't want to rely on that, and and people are getting scared because Social Security is not going to cover enough, so they have to make do with their own savings. But the problem is, um, there's no easy way just to say, I mean, there is, but people don't like the idea of, of taking their lump sum and, and turning it into income. And so they have this big lump sum and it's, when is in people's lives, Tony, when is the lump sum that you have your net worth usually highest? When is that usually the case? When is the lump sum the your, highest? Your net worth. When is your net worth like the highest it's going to be? At what point in your life? The day you retire? Usually. Right around retirement. You know, in the yeah. early years, you don't have much. You're just building up. Um, right. As you, If you have a family, you see that dip again when the kids come in the <laughs> yeah. picture, right? But once yeah, the kids are out of the, out of the house and you don't have those expenses and you can start building up wealth again, it's like a U-shaped curve, you know? It goes up and up, and then it starts to go down as you start spending it in retirement. So the idea is, you know, what is the peak? How much should I have? What's the magic number? And like I always say, there is no magic number. It's The answer isn't you need a million dollars and then you can retire. You know, that's, that's just ridiculous. Someone might need 10 million to retire based on their lifestyle. Someone might need 50,000 to retire based on their lifestyle. You know, if someone's got a pension and two social securities and two pensions, they may not need anything. They might have all the income they need from the pension, right? So everyone's different. So the, the, working toward this magic number isn't really the way to approach it. The way to approach it is, what do you have saved and will that get you through? And what I look at is when people go to retire, most of their assets are, are there saved. That's the highest point. And if... At that point, you lose 30%. That's going to hurt the most, right? And, you know, if you're 95 and you lose 30%, well, you know, how much longer do you have? Are you going to really be panicking at that point? But if you're 65 and retiring and you lose 30%, well, that's going to change your life because your retirement funds, at their peak, losing that much, that really hurts because it's tough to recover from. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is the reason why people start to reduce their risk as they approach retirement is because they don't want to get smacked down at their peak. Right. Because that's when they're at most exposed to this idea of sequence of returns risk. And that's what I want to talk about today. And then I want to also talk about this idea that you need to put everything in safety that's also the wrong way of doing it because theoretically what you could do is as you approach retirement, you take your lump sum, whatever you have saved and throw it under the pillow. Now I don't recommend doing that, but I'm using it as an analogy. If you're going to do that, get the my pillow, right? Cause that's supposedly got some pa <laughs> patent and fill so it won't hurt. <laughs> I know you love that guy. That's why I bring it up every time. <laughs> no, 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 I don't. Um, um, you could just put all your money in the bank, okay? And just live off of it. But most people don't have enough to do that. They need more. So you have to have it invested in some way. So the idea is, all right, we'll just buy CDs. And, you know, that doesn't work for everyone either, unless you have enough. You, you might have enough money where you can live off of 2% interest. That's ideal, right? You do it and you can get your 2% from the bank and keep up with inflation in another way. My thought is as you get to that retirement age, as you get older and past it, more and more of a percentage of your assets should be in the market. And this concept is called, there's a, there's a technical term for it, and you can look it up and read about it, but this is the way I believe. It's called rising equity glide path. So a glide path is, you know, when you're landing a plane, and you're a big you 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 have your pilot's license, right, Tony? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> well, imagine you do. <laughs> there's a, there's a path. A that, there's a path that imagine. you glide. Yeah. You know, a path that you glide down. And mm -hmm. as you're gliding through retirement, what percentage of your portfolio or overall um, assets are in equity, meaning stocks? 
as you get older, it should be rising, which is counterintuitive. And there's a reason. Yeah, for that it. is that's not the that's not the uh, typical wisdom out there. Right. Well, let's get let's get to the point here about why it's not typical wisdom. Most of the people. I'm going to say there's a lot of advisors out there. There's a ton of financial people and, you know, the whole fiduciary rule and who's a fiduciary, who's not. It, it It's not, you know, I, I'm not going to get into that debate right now. But what I will say is everyone's got a different specialty. And when you're dealing with somebody, you should know what their specialty is. And so if you're dealing with someone and you're 40 years old and you're planning to retire at 65, you got 25 years. I think it's pretty clear that at, with 25 years to go before retirement, you can take some risk, right? So investing for growth is probably uh, a good idea. So you should be working with someone who is focused on that, someone that can specialize and help you grow your assets. As you get closer to retirement, you're not really focused on growing your assets. You're focused on spending them and not running out. And so you want to work with someone that focuses on that. And that's what I do. I focus on retirement, figuring out how to get um, more out of your assets to make them last. There's a subset of people that are really focused, hypersensitive, and only compensated by helping you be safe. So you'll see them, their titles might be safe money expert or... I don't think they can call themselves financial advisors, um, you know, retirement uh, specialist. But basically, they want to help you get your, all of your money into safety. And the only way to do that is is to use their tools that they have, and that's the only tools they have access to. Mm. So you got the people that are helping you grow, and that's the only uh, tools they have access to. You got the people that are safety focus and that's the only tools they have access to so how do you make that switch do you hire two people and work that way and have them compete or do you work with someone that does both and that's kind of where i'm at i'm in the middle i'll go in any direction in terms of what solutions to use and so you want someone that's got that capability that can have growth assets and also have safety assets and my take is you don't want to go all in one you want to do a combo even as you retire you do not, and, and I'm, I'm talking generally, because some people might be different, but you do not want to just go all safe. You don't want to just eliminate the market from your, the stock market from your portfolio as you approach retirement and even into retirement. And in fact, what I'm suggesting is as you get into retirement and continue through retirement, you should have more of your assets at risk as you get older. Uh, the rule of 100 is, is a common a rule that I often use as a starting point, but some people take it way too literally. And they say you take the number 100 and you subtract your age. So if you're 70 years old, you take 100, subtract 70, that's 30. And that 30 represents a percentage. That 30% should be at risk. The other 70 should be in safety. Uh, you know, is that the case? And as you, so now you're 80, so 20% should be at risk, 80 in safety. I don't believe in that. I think it kind of goes the opposite direction. So um, hopefully I can, as we go through today, I can give some specific examples of what I'm talking about, what I mean by it and why I'm doing it. But would you agree that, that saying as you get older, you should have more at risk seems counter to what you're hearing out there, Tony? Oh yeah. I mean, obviously uh, I keep hearing that, hey, you know, we never know when the next 2008 is going to hit. And if you've got too much at risk or too much in the market, uh, you're going to be in a bad situation then. It's true if you do, but the bad situation isn't necessary. Let's take this, for example. If I had, if I had $100,000 to my name in 07 and I retired, and I put all 100,000 in technology stocks and they went down 40%. So now my 100,000 is 60,000. Am I in bad shape in retirement? Is my retirement at risk? Am I in jeopardy? Um, everyone's probably saying, of course, you just lost 40,000. You lost 40%. Of course your retirement's in jeopardy. But there's some missing information here in this scenario. What's missing? How much income do I have? 
What if I then went on to tell you, well, I actually, 100000 was the assets I invested, but I actually have a pension of 4000 a month. My wife has a pension of 4000 a month. We both have uh, Social Security, which comes out to another about 4000 a month. So we have about 12000 a month coming in um, on a guaranteed basis from my pension. So you're okay with that market money right? So going I, up, I'm going up and down. I have hundred and twenty k coming in. Uh, pre-tax, but I only, we only spend about 70 K. So, you know, after tax, we're still saving. In fact, we're saving about five, 600 a month. And it's just, we're just putting it in a checking account. We don't but really, that only it. works Dan, if you're not using those invested funds, pulling from them each month or, uh, on a monthly or yearly basis to, to pay your expenses. Bingo. That's the key, Tony, right? Are you using your investments to generate the income you need to live. In this case, this couple that I just described, um, they're not. They're not that 100K or whatever it is. It could be a million. It could be 5,000. If they're not using that money to live, then what difference does it make how much it goes up or down? I mean, it, obviously, people don't want to lose. No one wants to lose, right? So to lose 40%, it's not a good scenario. But it's not a retirement deal breaker. It's not like they're going to have to go back to work or they're going to have to, you know, start changing their lifestyle. But if the same scenario was I have a million dollars in the market and I'm generating my $70,000 a year I need to live partially from Social Security, but mostly from this investment portfolio, and that goes down 40%. So now my income is down 40%. Now that's a different story. Now, all of a sudden, we got an issue. And so I think the problem is that people are not separating their assets from their income. And people are not using their assets and they're not looking at their assets as a just true income source. Where they didn't have to think about it when you have a pension. Like I said, the, the police officer I was talking to, he's like, I got, you know, I'm going to get 70% of my 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 salary in retirement, so that's going to take care of most of me, my stuff. So he's not as worried about how much his nest egg is because he knows between Social Security and his pension, he's going to be okay. You know, he wants to do well, but he's more concerned about, you know, he, he gets it. But most people don't have pensions anymore. So they have to, so your nest egg is important in that it's what's going to be generating your income. So... Now, this goes back to the original question. Do you need more risk? Well, if 100% of your income is going to be coming from a portfolio in the stock market, then risk is of utmost importance to consider. You need to make sure that you don't have all of it at risk because if we do have a correction and your income goes down by 30%, you're probably not going to be happy and it's going to change your lifestyle and you run the risk of really having a retirement fail. So what we need to do is discuss the difference between income and assets, because it's very important, and we need to discuss what I mean when I say you need more risk as you get older. But I think uh, we need to take a quick break. But um, yeah, I think you hit it on the head when you said well, if you're generating income from that asset, that changes the game. Yeah. I would assume so, but you're making some great points as to why it is good to have uh, that money as much as you can, and still, but not using for income at risk. So you're generating some growth. But uh, I get that; that makes sense. We do have to take a quick break here, Dan. Is there anything else you want to add before we do? Yes. Yeah, so we're you're listening to Dolphin Financial Radio, and. My name is Dan Wendell. If you have just tuning into the show, we do this every week. Tony and I, we have fun with it, but I, I don't think I say it enough. My specialty is retirement income planning. That's truly where I focus. So this topic that we're talking today is really my bread and butter and what I do. I, I'm going to try and talk to you about a, a concept that is counterintuitive to what most of you out there are, are, have heard which is as you get older, you may want to have more assets at risk. And I'll explain that when we get back. But if you want to sit down and start talking about income and you want to start talking about your retirement and figuring it out, you might be 10 years away. That's the best time to start when you have time. But even if you already retired and you say, yeah, I got to rethink this. I'm not comfortable. 
I'll meet with you. And I do not charge for these meetings. We get to know one another. I think it's important that people understand that when you meet with me, the objective is to get to know me and my strategies, and I get to know you, and we see if we can work together. And if we can, then we move forward. But if we can't, there's no obligation. We'll just kind of end it there. And that's okay. You know, I meet with people sometimes, and we just don't click, and I don't mind. But there's only one way to find out if we click, is that's to sit down and talk to one another. I like to meet face-to-face with people. I do have some clients that we do online. But for the most part, I like to meet. I come to people's homes. You can come to my office in Clearwater. I'm right off of US 19, and we'll chat, figure out uh, a good time for us to to get to know one another. And the easiest way to do that is to give me a call, set up an appointment. The number to call is 888-508-5935. I do have a local number, if you prefer, 727-223-8454. Again, the number, 888-508-5935. All right. Thanks, Dan. And listeners, stay tuned. We're going to be right back with more of Dolphin Financial Radio and our host, Dan Wendell. Do you ever feel like you need a retirement toolkit to help navigate your retirement? Retirement can be scary, but it doesn't have to be. With our Retirement Income Toolkit, you can get the information you need to help secure your retirement. This toolkit provides valuable information on income planning, asset allocation, tax planning, legacy planning, and more. Receive your retirement toolkit from Dolphin Financial Group right now by going to dolphinfinancialgroup.com or by calling us at 888-508-5935. This is Violet and you're listening to Dolphin Financial Radio. And welcome back to Dolphin Financial Radio. I'm your co-host, Tony Shore, and our host, Dan Wendell, who, when he told me what he wanted to talk about on the show today, I thought he had gone crazy. Uh, taking more risk as we get older and in retirement sounds counterintuitive, but Dan, you're you're starting to make a good case here. Oh wow! I I got your uh, you got my attention. You got your anyway. approval already. Yeah, and I I well I I like where your head's at on this. As long as there are some caveats to, you know, that money that we have at risk can't be what you're counting on for income, right? That's kind of how we ended the last. Right. Uh, well, th- no. there's. we did a show a couple of weeks ago on inflation as the silent killer of retirement. So I want to talk about, you know, why that's important to consider as well. But I think the big risk that people don't know about because they don't really have to know about it until you retire is sequence of returns risk or sequence risk, like, like I call it. And I know, Tony, when we first started talking about sequence risk years ago, you thought I meant like the old school prom dresses from the 80s, the sequins dresses, you know, the the (laughs) shimmery. I think you went like a good two weeks of talking about it without realizing that's not what I was talking about. Uh, Oh, I thought you said sequins (laughs) of uh, of return i do mumble like like at, but... like at the uh, class <laughs> class reunion returning to school right. uh, wearing a sequins, sequins dress uh... yeah i thought that's the advice you were giving but uh that's my bad <laughs> uh okay i'll take blame on that when i just you know as i get older my hearing isn't so good <laughs> so it's not sequins of return <laughs> right it's sequence as in the Sequence. order, the order, the order yes. in which you that pull money them. out and take the money out. So when you access the money uh, is almost more important than how much you have, isn't it? You've said that. Before. Exactly. And that's a the, quote I've hung on to of yours and the order in which the returns come out. So if we have an right. average return of 7% in the stock market for the past 20 years, say, OK, let's just accept that as a general general. Let's just we'll call it 7%. That 7% includes 2008, in which we lost 20 plus percent, and includes 2017, in which we made 20 plus percent. But in neither of you those years did we come close to making seven, right? It was just, so the the problem, the, it's easy to say over the past 30 years, we've averaged 7%, and so that's what we're gonna average over the next 30 years. And even if you said to me, Dan, I'm guaranteeing that you're going to average 7% over the next 30 years. That's not helpful to somebody that needs to pull income from it because what if, what if 
over the next 30 years, we average 7%, but the first three years, we're down 20% every year. Negative 20, negative 20, negative 20, three years in a row. Ouch. That is the worst case scenario. That is the killer of retirement plans, no matter how well crafted. If you have negative returns early in your retirement, which by the way, is no fault of your own. It's not something you can control and it's not something that you should blame yourself for, but it happens. There are people that retired in 07 and just got crushed right away. Those people are going to have a very different retirement than someone that retired in 08 and 09 say, and then had all their assets go up, up and up for the next 10 years, you know? So, so I didn't mean to interrupt. No, but, no. So you're saying, you're saying that uh, I think where you're going with this is that, um, you know, if you have, you know, in order to prepare for that, uh, you, sh- you still need to take the risk and have the money in growth. But as long as you have enough safe money to meet your regular bills, because, you know, I think most of us are going to have Social Security. So that's one thing that's separate from the risk that we can count on. Of course, those fortunate enough to have a pension. But as we know, pensions have gone the way of the pension. Uh, <laughs> I like that. And then and then um, but but maybe we have other sources of say you can set up a personal pension. I know you help some people do that where appropriate. So they have their Social Security and then they have a personal pension or a fixed index annuity where they're getting a guaranteed fixed income uh, every month. And if you have your Social Security and that fixed income and that covers your basics, then uh, that's the way you can weather that type of 2008, 2007, 2008 loss. Is that what you're saying? That's right, Tony. You know, people have been combating sequence risk through the use of guaranteed income streams for a while. The pensions were a great idea. People can create their own pension. A lot of times they'll use an annuity to do that. Social Security is a type of annuity. It's just guaranteed payment. And so when you have the guaranteed income there, the ups and downs of the market don't necessarily affect you as much. But in the in for most people, they don't have that plan. So I do that a lot. I use a lot of guaranteed income sources to help combat it. But even if you do that, you're going to need to still factor in inflation risk, meaning you know, $1,000 today isn't the same as $1,000 20 years from now. So you still, if that's the case, are going to have more of your assets tied to something that could combat inflation, which would be the stock market. So um, there's this balance here. And, and you got to strike the balance between income that you need and risk that you need. And I think that once you get your baseline income, a simple way to look at the original question is, do you need more risk? If you have all your income covered through pensions or, or Social Security, whatever, you could throw the rest of your money in the market and it doesn't really matter now, does it? And you can have 100% of your assets at risk that as long as you have your income you need, right? So you could see, and isn't that the greatest play? If you don't need to touch it, in the long run, the market's the way, place to be. So 30 years from now, if you said, I don't need to touch this money, I'd say put it in the market, just like I would to a 20-year-old. Um, if you might be 60, but if you don't need that money, let's throw it in the market. So you could see how, if someone's got their income taken care of, then the rest of their assets could be highly risky and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So, right. But, but most people don't have all their income from a guaranteed source, right? In real, in real life, most people don't have a pension. Social security is not cutting it and they take Maybe they take some of their money to create their own personal pension, but they still have to rely on the rest of their assets to generate some sort of income. So what happens is, uh, how do you deal with that? And um, you still would run the risk of, of sequence risk, which is a bad few years. So what you try and do, and I guess we're going to get into some solutions here, really, but... Um, it's important that you understand that why a a few bad years can really derail you because you know you say oh that's not going to happen we're not going to lose 20% for 3 years in a row it's never happened what if it does what if it's not 20% that's kind of dramatic but let's say you lose 20% the first year and then the next year it's down 5 and then the next year it's down 2 
I mean, that's terrible because your income coming out of there is coming out when it's lower. And when we do have a recovery, which it usually is, you're going to have less money to re recover with. You know, if you lose 20% one year and you make 20% the next year, you're not, you, you didn't break even. You're not back to even there. No. You, know? you have to make a whole lot more to break even. If you lose 50% in one year, you need to make 100% the next year just to break even. Uh, people forget that. It's a simple math, wow. but, yeah. but people don't realize that. So recovering from a few negative years early is difficult. Now, if we have great years early, you know, if you have a 20% upside, a 7, a 20, you know, uh, three years in a row, then all this is irrelevant, right? You know, it's all nonsense because you've you done well. But that's the big fear. Uh, who knows what's going to happen? And who, who's going to try and time the market? We know that's, that's just not going to happen. How do you deal with retirement sequence risk when you have that large bulk of money at the end of your, of your working years? You're going to want to make sure it's not all at risk, of course, and you're going to want to make sure some is at risk for the future. And so you need to make sure that you have different areas you can pull from, different uh, buckets, I'll call it. Uh, that's a big term a lot of retirement planners use. Um, yep. Different pools of money, different asset classes so that we have um, an option to go somewhere if the market corrects. So if you have money in the stock market and it corrects 20%, you're not going to want to pull money out from that when you're down 20. You don't want to sell at the bottom, which is what everyone does. That was the last show we talked about, why investors lose. You know, uh, you just don't want to do that. So what are you going to do? Well, you have to pull from somewhere else, which is why you need to set up somewhere else prior to. You can't just magically come up with money later. So you need to start thinking in terms of, I have different pools of money that, are, that I'll pull from when it's strategic in, a, in my best interests. So you invest in the market. If the market goes up, you can pull your income from there. If the market goes down, you got to pull from another source, whether it's a CD at the bank or money under the pillow. Um, another sequence risk, uh, a way to combat it, reverse mortgage. Most, the biggest asset for most people is their home. Uh, it sounds crazy, but I use, and I, it, it makes sense when you do the numbers. I will sometimes help have people use the home equity as a place to go to in times of market corrections because the home equity is just sitting there otherwise. And people don't realize it's a huge asset that you can tap into without having to move. Right, you can you could take a loan against the house, a home equity line of credit, or a reverse mortgage, which is also called a, um, a, a it's it's a line of you can have a reverse line of credit, you know, so home equity conversion mortgage it's called Heckam. So there's different ways to use different assets, and what people are just so ingrained is that we're going to have all my money in a 401k in the market or bonds. What if the bond market and the stock market both go down, which is happening? You know, what if that happens? You need another way to look at it. You got to look beyond the traditional stock market for other pools of money and combat and uh, um, sequence risk by having those ready and built in your plan. Sure. And what happens is what you find is if you do it correctly, as you get older, a larger percentage of your assets would actually be in the market. And there's a reason for that is because in the long run, the stock market's the place to be. I don't think anyone's going to dispute that. Real estate agents might say that, you know, real estate's the place to be fine, whatever, but it's still at risk. If, if you look long term, you put your money over there. As you get older, you're spending the, the safe money you know, the, 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 the risk, less risky money to live. So as a percentage, by default, your equities are growing long term. So they're going to rise as a percentage of your overall net worth. So as you get older, you'll see that more and more of your assets as a percentage are at risk. And that's okay. That's okay because that's where the place to be in the long term. So this idea of, oh, you know, stocks are bad, get rid of them as you retire, you get rid of, run away, run fast away from your broker. Maybe not. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say a broker is the place to talk to. You, you want to work with a fiduciary, an investment advisor, but 
don't get rid of stocks as you get older because that's what's going to help you combat the inflation risk, which we talked about in the last show or the two yeah. two shows ago, I think. Well, yeah, and and so uh, basically, uh, a big you're taking a big risk by having too much in safe money because of things like inflation and what you've mentioned on the show before, investment opportunity loss. So you're losing the opportunity for growth and you're going backwards because of what you called in a couple of shows ago, the silent killer, which is inflation, right? That's a good point, Tony. Thank you. I, I, I got to stress that. But you, you know, if, if I said to you, Tony, give me all your money, we're going to make 3% guaranteed for the rest of your life. That may not be good enough. It may be yeah. sound good now. Not but, with health care costs. Right. If health care costs going up 15% or, or um, you know, g- general inflation being above three, that 3% is maybe not so good. So you don't want to lock in all your money at some low rate now. Uh, if if that's if it's going to take all your money, if you get if you got to put all your money in safety and you got nothing left to invest for the long term and risk, that's not the way to do it either. I mean, you, you're right. You, you're missing out by going safe route. So you don't want to go one direction or the other. You want to go in both. You want to spread out the risk and make sure you have the upside potential for. Inflation. I mean, we could have high inflation in the future here, Tony. We're we're seeing signs of it. So, you know, what's to say we can't have five percent inflation in a year? I mean, what then? You know that that two uh, percent CD that you locked into doesn't sound so appealing anymore. You're losing money, inflation, buying power. Um, so you have to balance it. You need to have multiple sources with different levels of risk. And I'm going to s- still contend that for most people. Well, maybe not most, but many, many people, equities or high risk assets will be a higher percentage as you get older, just because of the upside potential there to combat inflation, to be flexible and to allow for you to have your lifestyle increase as you get older. I always say successful retirement is about increasing income and decreasing stress. And so there's a balance there, uh, increasing income. You got to go take some risk to get that. But uh, reducing stress also means you don't want to be all scared of the stock market and have all your eggs in that basket. So there's got to be this balance. And I think the balance has shifted and more and more people are realizing now as they get older, hey, I got to pull back on the reins. But I think what people right. are doing is they're overcorrecting. They're overcorrecting yeah. on the wheel and they're slowing down too much. And they're not factoring in longevity and inflation, which can be just as bad. Um, it's it's basically you're running out of money in that way, which is slow and painful. You know, it's not as tra- it's not as obvious as a stock market correction, but it hurts. Mm. Well, yeah, obviously it hurts, and so um, the yeah, a lot of people just don't take into consideration inflation and the risks of some of the safe money options, but. You know, and I do hear you hear these people. Hey, I can guarantee, you know, three, four percent. Well, um, you know, some people get cut up in the guarantee, which is, hey, it's good uh, to have a guaranteed income every month in retirement, and and that's important. But you have to look at, uh, you know, the realism behind it, and is it really guaranteed? Is it always going to be there? Is it the, going to maintain its value? Um, mm-hmm. the problem is, is you might have a guaranteed income, but your need goes up every month, even though your income stays the same. Right. right. Or you have an emergency that you need to, you know, and so is your plan flexible for that? You know, maybe you decide you want to go on a trip early, you know, do you have that built in? Well, no, I got my, I got my pension, you know, pe- the pensions are great, you know, and they're gone. <laughs> they went the way of the pension. I like that. <laughs> but, um, if you went to the pension company and said, Hey, you know, I know you give me 2,500 a month, but. Can you show, you know, throw me four thousand a month for the next few? I, I need, I want to go on this trip. You know, that's they're gonna. It'll be funny, actually. They wouldn't even know how to respond. I think they would laugh. But um, so, you, yeah. so, 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 yeah. g- the guaranteed income is great. You know, social, social security is great because you know it's there and and you can plan for it. But you need to have some upside for inflation. But you also need that flexibility to go and do the things you want to do. So you have to have some sort of combination here, and so. Um, it's easy. If you have enough to create the guaranteed income you need and you have some left over, then it's easy. That's that's the easiest way to do it. You get the income you need on a guaranteed basis. Whatever you have left, then we invest, right? That's ideal. 
not everyone can afford that. So they have to take some risk. And, and I think though that it, you'd be surprised. I think just creating some sort of baseline, even if it's 70% of what you need, it, it allows you to, to take a little bit of a breath, a little bit of a breather, knowing that you do have some baseline income, but you're right. You can't just just rely on that blindly. You have to also think long-term and, and the buying power of that. So you have to combat the inflation risk while at the same time combating sequence risk, which is really all about the early years and make sure that, uh, you can't, you counteract both and you can't just go after one because the, you know, while you're looking one way, something's going to sneak up behind you. You have to look at both, which is what I do, which is why, you know, I'm saying retirement income planning, it's, it's, it's science, but it's also, you know, there's an art to it as well. And I can do numbers all day and I have some clients that are engineers and they love to see spreadsheets and I have them, but at the same time, you also have to talk realistic. You have to talk, you know, no one knows what inflation is going to be, but you got to talk about it. You got to kind of guess. And and there's a bit of an art to it and things change. So you want it to be flexible. You don't want to just be stuck, you know? So, um, but then again, we talked about one of the reasons why most people fail in investing is because they are constantly changing things. You know, they don't hold on to the plan. They don't stick with it. So that means they're probably not comfortable with the original plan. So you got you to sit down and do this so you're not second-guessing yourself and chasing returns and making foolish decisions and getting in and out because that's where you lose. You have to just yeah. come up with the plan, make sure it covers all the bases, and then stick with it and be happy with it. I think, I think that's what people are missing out. And I think this yeah. idea that, oh, you got to avoid stocks at all costs – as you get older, that's just that's sensational hyperbole, and I think it's kind of, I think people are catching on that that's not that's not accurate. Yeah. Yep. Well, that's a great point. Good advice, Dan. I'm glad you went over this. Uh, some surprising advice in there, but really important, and it totally makes sense. I I know I got something out of it. I'm sure our listeners. Do. 